So we're going to have a presentation from Chainlink and Polkadot, and then we're going to finish it up the night with a quick fireside chat where we'll talk a little bit more in depth about the presentations themselves, and then also have an opportunity for everyone to ask questions after the two presentations. So we save your questions for the end. We'll uh, have an opportunity to, to ask those. So first up, we have Johan Eid, product manager at Chainlink based in Paris, who's going to give you a background on what they've been working on both in the Ethereum ecosystem and what's next. Awesome. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for coming. Uh, thanks to Polkadot for working with us on organizing this meetup. Yeah. So, yeah, today I'm going to speak about what Chainlink has been doing recently. By the way, there is a lot of eco. Uh, let's see. Yeah, maybe a bit lower. Test, test. Okay, let's let's do it this way. All right. Yeah. So, basically, Chainlink has been working on connecting real-world data and events to the blockchain. So, as you guys probably know, blockchains, blockchain technology has many great promises, right? Like transparency, decentralization. I'm sure you've all heard it. I think. One of the best aspects is really smart contracts. Smart contracts can revolutionize the way people interact with each other, right? Basically, instead of having third-party institutions which enforce agreements between people, you will have peer-to-peer -peer agreements which get enforced by the blockchain, basically. The enforcer here is a code. It's not a third party, it's not a bank, it's not a law. It's basically the code which is enforcing everything that should happen when you enter in a contract with a peer, basically. So, okay, perfect. Now, the issue with smart contracts currently is that they have no access to real world data, right? Uh, for instance, a network like Polkadot, the substrate chains, well, validators there secure the network, right? But they don't build the connection with API endpoints. They are not able to get you the data from, you know, pricing API, from IoT data, all of this stuff, right? And now this data is super important if you want to bring anything meaningful. Like we've been seeing, for instance, the rise of DeFi uh, recently. And DeFi, it's very evident, needs data from you know, crypto prices, FX, commodity. If you want to have collaterals, if you want to have interest rates, you need specific pieces of data to make sure your application can function correctly, right? So basically, yeah, that's the way we think about it, blockchains have no access to real world data and to have anything meaningful being built up on a blockchain, you need this data. Otherwise, you're limited to tokenization, which tokenization is great, you can have crypto kitties, right? But I think you all entered the space for something a bit more meaningful than trading digital, digital cats between each other, basically. So, yeah. Um, what we think is that 80, 90% of the real world applications will come into crypto once they have access to data points, to specific API endpoints, which you can query and which you can work with to have uh, any applications that you would need and that you want to have you know, from the real world. Basically derivatives, futures contracts, money markets, all of this stuff needs data. Now, the way we want to do it is to have end-to-end -end reliability, which means when you use blockchain technology, you get into blockchain because there is a certain promise with blockchain, right? There is a promise of transparency, of decentralization. Basically, you're paying a high cost by working on the blockchain because there are security guarantees that you don't have otherwise, right? And what you believe is that these security guarantees need to be provided end-to-end. Basically, when you're going to get data from an external source, you need to make sure that you're not getting this data from one single node. Otherwise, you get into a paradigm which doesn't make much sense, which is you have multiple nodes distributed around the world. So for instance, I think right now on Kusama, there is like 160 validators. You know, it's, it's a huge amount, right? So there is a big emphasis on security. And you don't want the security to be threatened by basically external data, which can trigger a contract or an action, and this data wouldn't be secured, wouldn't have the same security guarantees that you have on the blockchain, right? So you don't want this model. You don't want 
one single centralized node which is feeding data to your application. Otherwise, there is no point building on a smart contract or on substrate, let's say, right? So basically, the way we do it at Chainlink is we believe end-to-end -end security is extremely important. We want to have the same guarantees that you have building on a blockchain whenever you are accessing API endpoints, which means we want decentralization. We want multiple nodes which are getting data from the same API endpoints and which are feeding this data onto the blockchain. What this means is if you have a network of 12 Chainlink node operators which are getting you the price of EQSD, if one or two of these operators go down for some reason, because an outage can always happen, right? Well, you will still get the data, and that's critical. If you don't get data from EQSD, let's say in an application where you can have margin calls and where basically collateral can be liquidated, it's a very big problem. Now it's the same for gold USD or for any other asset. Um, so yeah, basically we've been setting up these networks which, which allow people to get access to real world data. I won't go into everything here um, because it's a bit too much for a 15 minute talk, but yeah, that's the premise. And now what we've been doing recently, it with, which I'm very excited about, um, I mean, you guys probably all know this for people who've been in the blockchain industry for a while. Um, you know, it's been a space which has been looking for something, I feel like, an identity and something, you know, which people can really use and which really shows the efficiency and the utility, the utility of blockchain, right? And what you've been seeing lately has been the rise of DeFi, basically, where multiple applications are basically trying to recreate finance on the blockchain using smart contracts, right? So. Now, what we've seen with this rise is that many of these applications needed real-world data. They needed pricing data, right? And there was no way for these people to get this pricing data except building it themselves. Now, whenever you're going to build a certain component, you have to decide, right? Like, if you are a smart contract creator and you want to build a DAP, are you going to build the whole infrastructure around your DAP? Or are you just going to use an existing framework, like for instance, in the case of Polkadot Substrate, to build it on top of it, right? Well, I think it's better to build something that has already been tried and tested by teams than building your own blockchain, let's say, and basically starting from scratch, right? It's the same case for oracles. If you are going to need pricing data, you don't want to create your own oracles. You want to be able to use something that has already been worked on for many years, which has a network, which has a whole economy behind it, right? So that's why at Chainlink, we've been setting up multiple reference contracts, which feed the price of different assets, which are needed by DeFi dApps. And these DeFi dApps, basically you can see supported by, uh, just below, uh, they're consuming this data actively and they need it, let's say, to create synthetic assets, in the case of synthetics. Uh, in the case of Aave, let's say, which is another user, they need it whenever they're calculating interest rates, right? So it's a money market for Aave, and people put up collateral. Well, you need to see the price of this collateral to see whenever there needs to be a margin call, let's say, right? So basically, that's what we've been working on, creating reference contracts just like this one, which feeds the price of a certain API endpoint. This price is being fed by multiple node operators. So node operators are blockchain infrastructure projects, basically. I think probably all of these guys are currently running on uh, Kusama right now, which is pretty funny. I think there is a small overlap there. And these people are accessing multiple API endpoints and feeding back the data from a specific endpoint to the blockchain, basically. And this data gets aggregated. So what you have here is a very transparent, you see everything, right? Decentralized network, which allows you to get data onto the blockchain and which dApps can easily leverage, basically by just reading one line of codes to get the price of an asset, any asset currently. We have more than 29 reference contracts which are being consumed by users. And what we've gotten in the last month, basically, is more than four users currently using us so the ones I'm featuring here are Aave, Synthetix, Loopring, Ampleforth, and here basically we're seeing different use cases, right? So Synthetix needs to, to create synthetic assets. To create these synthetic assets, they need the prices, 
of these assets, right? So they need to know how much gold is worth to mint a gold synthetic asset on, on the blockchain, right? Ave has collateral, basically they're a money market, so they need to know the price of assets also in real time. So all of these applications are currently using a reference contract to secure the value that is in their, in their protocol. So Chainlink is the underlying Oracle solution to, to access data for these projects, basically. And we've seen the rise of DeFi, like it's been pretty exponential lately. Currently, this, the value being secured by our reference contracts is more than probably 100, well, it's probably more than 150 million, but I, I say this number because it's been rising daily. Um, and yeah, it's been going more and more. Like currently, I think, the, yeah, we are really positioning ourselves to become the standard for dApps to access real world data. I think it's extremely important. Currently, what you're seeing, I believe, is really a his historical moment, basically. Like, in a few years, we'll probably be thinking those were exceptional times because we're seeing the rise of more and more applications which are already rebuilding the way we interact with each other and the way finance used to be done, right? And I think that's really a great moment, and at Chainlink, we're thrilled to be supporting this. And now, what you're... Let's see, I, I'll probably skip this also because I'm probably over my time. Um, all right, yeah. What we're super excited also is to see the rise of many more platforms. I think it's very hard to, to see many blockchains which are really delivering and networks which are really delivering and which we find promising, right? So Polkadot was one of these networks which we wanted to, to support for a while. We announced something a while ago saying that we would be working together. And now we've been working more and more with the Polkadot and the Parity team to implement Chainlink onto the network, basically. And basically what we want to have is the same thing as, if, as what we've been doing on Ethereum, where we've been kind of incentivizing and fostering this growth for, for dApps, basically. Where if they need data, they can just use the Chainlink oracles to easily query API endpoints and to access any kind of data they would need. So people who want to build DeFi dApps on Polkadot, uh, on the network, people who want to build uh, insurance contracts, people who want to build any kind of application that needs real world data, will be able to easily access Chainlink. And what we hope by, by this is to foster kind of an ecosystem, growing ecosystem, and to help the growth on the Polkadot network. So, yeah, I think that was most of what I wanted to go over. Um, again, we are really thrilled to be working with the Polkadot network. I'm extremely excited about what's happening right now in the whole ecosystem. I think these months are, ex are going to be extremely important to see where, where the ecosystem goes, basically where blockchain goes, the capabilities that we can offer. And yeah, it's been kind of like, you know, you're, you're a guy in a desert and you don't really know what blockchain is going to offer. And now we are seeing basically this oasis, which is people are actually being able to use blockchain technology for real world use case. And people are actually benefiting from it. And we are thrilled to be supporting this growth. So thank you very much for coming and yeah, for listening. Thank you very much, Johan. Now we're gonna hear from uh, Joe Petrowski, research analyst and general know-it-all at Parity Technologies. Uh, I think that him and Johan have quite similar jobs, so I think I might call Johan a know-it-all too. Uh, and Joe's gonna talk about some of the capabilities that Polkadot brings to the table for Oracles. Is there like a changer thing? to uh, let you know you should text your friends, text your wife. We got tacos coming afterwards and uh, DJ and open bar until 9 p.m. So it should be a, a good time. Have everyone come by. All right, cool. 
So um, I've known that I'm doing this for like a month or two, and naturally I waited until the last minute to think about what I was going to talk about, but on the flight over here from Berlin, I was reading uh, Range by David Epstein, and in like the last chapter he talked about how um, team, successful teams always have lower boundaries at their interface for inter information to travel between different groups. And so I thought, well, Chainlink provides an interface to Polkadot, and I'll talk about that a little bit. Um, oops, hello. Yeah. So um, if we just talk like a little bit about progression of interfaces, um, in Web 1, we started out with information being like static. It didn't really change. No matter who you were, you saw the same thing. Um, but it was linked together and pretty much like completely unvalidated, and people were rightfully skeptical. You weren't really allowed to use this on like school reports or anything. And it was like, we got the expression, if it's on the internet, it must be true. Um, of course, it means the opposite. Um, and all the interfaces in Web 1 were intrinsic. So the interface in, of a web page in, one, in Web 1.0 was to other websites. But it didn't really have like an interface to the real world. It was just like whatever people put on these websites. Um, and there was no kind of like validation. And they only talked to other websites. Um, and then Web 2 came along. Um, where the information was dynamic, and it was dynamic, like they were able to do this because they just put all the information in the silo. Um, most people on their like personal website didn't want to build a database that could hold all of their information that they have, but Facebook did, and they just let people put it in. And of course, Facebook didn't want to share that information. So the information just became trusted. Like whatever website you see, you're trusting the people who are behind that, that they're displaying you the correct information or what the person who uploaded that information actually uploaded and they haven't like modified this or changed it in any way. Um, but it came with a lot of other interfaces like into the real world. So um, like sensors like camera, GPS, accelerometer, microphone, they could take all this data and put it into their silos um, or databases. Um, and then they started having real world effects. So like this started with like Instagram and Facebook where people were just put information there. Um, but then we got like Uber where your information like your GPS location could actually result in like a car coming to pick you up and move you somewhere else. So um, if we want like, so it, in a blockchain like we can have this kind of like advantage over one point web one where we can actually like validate um, and verify the information that it's like it's gone through some transparent validation process and that it fits in some form and hasn't been manipulated in any way. Um, and we can have blockchains talk to each other and like send messages to each other and whatnot. Um, but they still need to interface with the real world and Web3 can't really beat Web2 if we can't offer the same services but in a better way. There's like a really long lag when you press the button. Okay, so Polkadot provides the blockchain to blockchain interfaces. Um, which is great, but like a blockchain on its own is, it's like a, a giant abstraction of a single computer. So like a, a blockchain, is, it operates like a single computer and computers have this interesting property where they don't really understand anything in the outside world. Like a computer only understands the information that's inside of it. And it's up to humans to decide what information they want to put in computers and in what context and how they want to encode the information into a data structure that the computer can understand. And the thing is that the information that we want to put in computers changes over time because people invent new things, they have new perspectives, um, new contexts develop. We see this in like uh, linguistics, new words get added to the dictionary every year, um, new generations come along and they want to express new things that previous generations didn't ever like think of to express. And so um, in order for computers to stay relevant, um, they have to be able to upgrade and we have to be able to make uh, we have to be able to get these context changes and new information into them. And so you need an interface to the real world if you want to actually change that interface of what you're putting into the computer. And so you need it for two reasons. One is so that blockchains can make decisions about themselves, um, about like what new information they want to encode and put into them um, and what kind of logic they might want to change um, or express. Um, but also to interact with external information and not just external decisions. And so I'm going to talk a little bit about what I mean by information versus decisions. Um, am I? Okay, so um, information can be provably true or true just because everybody believes that it's reasonable. So um, an example of something that is 
provably true is a transaction. Um, like you can prove that somebody wants to send money to somebody else just by the fact that they signed a transaction with a private key that says they want to do it. Like that's pretty easy to encode into a computer and make it understand. Um, but then there's other information that's true, but you can't really prove it in this kind of way. Um, and this kind of falls into two categories. There's information that's relevant to the system itself, and there's information that's relevant to the user. So information that's relevant to the system, this might be like the time. So like um, you want this network of computers to agree what time it is, but you can never have all of the computers have a synchronized clock. And even if you did, you could never predict the network delay in actually sending the messages that says, this is what time I have on my computer. So when another computer receives this message, they're always going to have a different time because there was some time to send that message. Um, so uh, actually, I'll talk about how we deal with that on the next thing. And then there's information that's relevant to a user, like your GPS location. Um, the system probably doesn't really care about it that much, um, and it's going to need some other way to validate it. Um, so yeah. Some of the interfaces for these different types of information, and I don't remember if I have another one. Yeah, I do. Okay, so um, we have this thing called inherence, which is how we deal with some of this information that's relevant to the system, like time. So you could say, um, for for a time, if you receive a message with a time, you could say, okay, I'm going to put two rules on this. One is that the time has to be later than my current clock, um, because if it's earlier, that means there was like some negative time happened where the the network didn't. Like network sent it super fast. You were obviously out of sync. Um, and then it has to be like within two seconds. So uh, it has to be greater than my clock, but not more than two seconds. And then I'm going to say like, yeah, okay, that seemed reasonable. It's true. Um, and then we have this other category called unsigned transactions, um, which we want to limit. Um, and this is other information like for a validator, they're going to want to send a message that they're online. And th so this would be like information that comes from keys that don't actually have any funds behind them. So we can't charge transaction fees for them. Like it might be a signing key for consensus, um, or it might be like um, when you're claiming, like on our DOT tokens now, you can claim from Ethereum, and you say you send a message from an address on Polkadot that says, hey, I want to claim my DOT tokens to this address. Well, those don't exist yet, so you can't pay a transaction fee for that. Um, so we need some like spam limiting thing so that people can't send like a billion of these and crash the network. Um, so these tend to have some sort of custom validation logic also that says like, you know, I'll just reject the second transaction. If I ever get like another signed message from this address, or it's not even an address, it's just a key, because um, there's no funds in it. Like I'm just gonna reject it, I'm not even gonna like deal with it at all. Um, and there's users, so like um, a signed transaction would be like a funds transfer, like pretty simple. Um, the account already has funds on it. We can put a transaction fee on it because the account has signed it. Um, and so we can limit that. Just, you know, that one's easy. That's like the easy thing to do. That's like Bitcoin or Ethereum. Um, and then there's like dealing with the outside world part. Um, so the typical way you might do this um, on a blockchain is to have like a blockchain client and then some off chain application um, that will talk to the client over uh, an RPC. And this has some like pretty severe limitations, um, main, mainly with like the RPC interface because um, it's going to be slow. Like you have to serialize and deserialize this data in both directions to actually talk to it. Um, so it just adds a lot of overhead to like going into like reading the state and all the um, like disk I/O with that goes along with that, and then like serializing it, sending it to some off-chain app application, deserializing it there, and then like doing the same thing backwards. Um, so we don't really like doing that. Um, so we have this concept in uh, Substrate and Polkadot of an off-chain worker, and it just basically moves this thing inside of the client. So we don't have to like do any serialization or deserialization. Um, it can just talk directly to the state um, and the database like within the client itself. Oops. All right. And then, so these have some like pretty useful things, but also some limitations. Um, so they're really good for high computation tasks. Um, like if you're gonna have something that's gonna take 20 or 30 seconds to actually execute, and right now our run times are single threaded, um, although we are working on that. Um, you can basically like trigger this at a certain block and say, hey, uh, at block 100, here's the state, go pull these values and go do this computation and then come back and report when you're done, but without actually like um, holding up the production or execution of that block um, the limitation that goes along with that is that 
these off-chain workers have to actually submit transactions to um, submit their computations because it could take five blocks to execute this computation. And then, um, so you know, you send this off at block 100, and then it goes and like does this computation, and it comes back at one block 105. Well, the state could have changed in that time, and that computation is no longer valid. And so it actually has to report the result as a transaction and say, like, kind of request to make the state change. Um, it's really good for non-deterministic tasks. Um, and I guess like encryption and decryption kind of falls under high computation, um, one of those annoying things. Um, but like non-deterministic tasks, this kind of goes along with like the custom validation thing. That's also a limitation. Um, but you could put like a true random number generator um, in an off-chain worker, as long as you have some way of agreeing that it actually executed this true random number generator. Um, but then all of those tasks that you designate to this off-chain worker that are non-deterministic, you need some validation logic for how you're going to accept them. Um, and then this other limitation, it's kind of like a mixed thing that it, it's declared in the runtime. Um, so we can execute runtimes in like a native environment, um, like on bare metal or in like a WebAssembly compiler or interpreter. Um, if you choose to like execute this in WebAssembly, then you get like the upgradability where you can just like push new logic into this off-chain worker and you can just upgrade it um, as you wish without making people update their clients. Um, but if you don't, if you want to execute in like a native environment, which would be like a, like a true random number generator or something, um, then you know, this isn't the client. You can't do like the forkless upgrades thing for the off-chain worker. Um, but luckily we have Chainlink and their kind of specialization is dealing with how do you come up with this custom validation for this information or computation that comes from somewhere else? And I think that was it. So I'll give it back to Peter. Thank you very much, Joe. And Johan, if you want to come up, we're, uh, we'll have a conversation, a little bit more depth in what we're talking about here. We have more than one mic. Uh, so I introduced you both by title, which is kind of boring, because I think you both have pretty interesting separate, different paths to very similar jobs. So I'm interested in hearing a little bit more about how you got here uh, today. Uh, I'm just a product manager. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, so I started in crypto a few years ago. Um, so at the time I was a software developer. Now, I got pretty passionate into crypto as I was always kind of familiar into you know, how the way central banks work and, you know, the way, you know, collapse, you know, booms and busts are basically created. And, yeah, what, what's, what sounded super interesting to me with Bitcoin, you know, was this kind of scarcity, which was basically already coded at the protocol layer, right? And for me, like, in an economy where we live today, where basically people, well, the Fed can print as much money as they want, you know, you don't have really any guarantees on what happens. It was a kind of really good value proposition. Now, I never got involved into Bitcoin because I didn't know what to do. I, I think the, what the Bitcoin community was quite interesting about is that it was kind of a bit more closed than what we got when Ethereum started, right? Where basically anyone could come in and could start participating, could start, you know, you know proposing stuff for the protocol, but also coding stuff, you know, on top of Ethereum, right? So at the time, I started getting pretty much into it. I started getting into the interoperability space also. Like, uh, I think your siloed network won't ever um, bring anything of value, right? I mean, sure, it's, it's interesting, like intranet, for instance, but the real value of internet when, was when you bridged all the intranets, all the closed networks together, and you created a wide network, right? Like a worldwide network where people could communicate easily. And I think it's the same thing for blockchain. Uh, how do you bridge different blockchains and how do you bridge also more, well, I think very importantly, the blockchain to the real world. Uh, I think that's where the value comes in and that's why I, I got very much into this uh, interoperability question. Uh, I joined a project called OneChain which was focusing on interoperability and then I got into Chainlink which was also focusing on interoperability but with the real world. Uh, yeah, so that's kind of how I got So a, a fairly direct path and what we would call maybe the sort of idealistic perspective which really gets, get, got you into the space, which is in quite a contrast to Joe. I'm not going to say you're not idealistic about the technology, but um, if you read the, uh, a, 
event description, it was a little bit less direct of a path. Yeah, so I first heard of like Bitcoin and crypto in like 2011 or 12. Um, I was living here in Denver. Um, and like I thought it was cool and interesting, but I didn't really get it. I mean, everything kind of works pretty well for me uh, with the normal system, if you will. And then like I kept following it a little bit like through like the Mt. Gox and Silk Road stuff in like 2013 and 14. And then I guess like I got a lot more interested in 2015 when I moved um, first to England and then to France and just like trying to like close my English bank account and get them to give me my money back, um, which took like three months to do. I was like, oh, okay, maybe that crypto is uh, in an interesting thing. Um, and then, yeah, I was just like in 2015 and 2016, um, I was a professional cyclist and I was living in this like little village in Normandy and um, just like when you're a cyclist, you spend like most of your job is resting. Like you do a little bit of training in the morning and then you just like lie in bed the rest of the day. And I, I kind of knew like I was getting close to the end of cycling and maybe had like one or two seasons left. And so um, just got like more into crypto and like I was thinking about what, in, what I wanted to do. And I used to be an engineer and like do a lot of like uh, time series analysis um, and like, yeah, statistics and like uh, finite element An modeling. aerospace engineer working on satellites. Yes. <laughs> Um, and so I was like, okay, well, if I need to get back into like programming or engineering, then I'll just do what I do what I want to, or do what I'm f already familiar with just to like get my skills back a little bit. So I started looking on the internet for like time series and um, like I wasn't close to a city at all. So I was like, oh, I could like make money by like writing trading algorithms from my little apartment. And um, first I actually looked at stocks, but then I realized like it's really expensive to get like a good data feed or like good quality stock data. Um, and I was like, oh, well, there's all these like free crypto APIs where you can just go like pull these public data sets for free. And um, yeah, so I just started looking at like all like Bitcoin, Ethereum, Litecoin, time series stuff. And then start, and then uh, that was like the point where I started to think like, oh, um, what, like, what actually is Ethereum beyond like a time series? Um, yeah, and then I just kind of went, got more into it from there. And after, yeah, I guess like that was like 2016 and then did that for a couple of years and then ended up at Parity in 2018. Very interesting, very different. The long way. The long <laughs> way, the direct route, and uh, most of Joe's was on a bike. Uh, so we'll talk a little bit now about the actual tech. Um, we, we talked a decent amount about sort of what you've built, but in terms of the process of, of building an Oracle, how do you approach building uh, secure systems a lot of people are like, oh, you know, if this thing fails, we're fucked. Excuse my language. So tell me more about how you approach secure Oracle development. Yeah, yeah definitely. So <laughs> I, I think one of the most important aspects of Chainlink and the way currently Chainlink is working is really decentralization, right? So basically the, the way, I mean, the whole space has been built is basically you have people who come to consensus on the state of a network, for instance, on the state of Bitcoin, right? It's the same thing right now for Chainlink where people come to consensus on the state of a specific data point. And the way you can do with Chainlink currently is you can scale your security, which means you can add more nodes for a specific API endpoint, depending on the value which, which relies on this endpoint, right? So let's say you have $1 billion which are sitting in collateral for, let's say, a stable coin. Well, you probably would want as much node operators as possible to secure this value because I mean, $1 billion, the, the reference contract which is giving you this value goes down, it's very bad, right? So basically, we have this kind of concept of scalable security, which means the more security you need, the more decentralization you'll get, right? So it's kind of decentralization on demand, basically. Uh, the other way we have, and we have many different ways to approach this issue, is there are crypto economic guarantees, for instance, which we are working on where basically node operators will be able to stake a certain amount of link tokens. And basically whenever they stake an amount of link tokens, they enter into an agreement with the smart contract creator. The creator says, hey, I want this specific endpoint. I want it fed every, let's say, five minutes. I want you to use this gas price because I don't want to get front run on this endpoint by you know, malicious actors. And if you don't fulfill your commitment, so you don't, if you don't fulfill, it's, it's basically an SLA which you have on chain. If you don't fulfill the commitment, you know, of providing this value, 
then you'll get slashed automatically on the value you, you put up in collateral. So that's another crypto economic guarantee. We have TEs, which are basically a way for people to run their code into an enclave and basically provides privacy, confidentiality, but also more security that the code which is being ran wasn't tampered with, right? So we have some kind of, I would call it, well, we call it a defense in depth approach where we layer in multiple approaches to security. The first one being decentralization and we are adding many new ones. I think for something as important as data, you can't be too prudent and you can't have enough security ever, right? Um, so yeah, basically decentralization right now is fine, but we need to add more and we are working on it. So you're approaching the development of both the, the structure and, and the, the code itself from a security first perspective, but we know things can and will go wrong. So I'm interested in uh, A, looking at governance from an Oracle's perspective in terms of being a, a, a fail safe, but also in terms of governing Oracle networks themselves and how those that participate in and want to determine the future of uh, these networks might coordinate around those decisions. Yeah, definitely. Okay, so yeah, currently I think the way governance will work with uh, Chainlink and you know, like currently I've seen you the EthUSD, the, the different price feeds we have, right? Like we have prices for FX, for commodity. Now, how do these prices get sustained? Well, what we're looking at is basically having some kind of governance where a community of users which are using the same price feed, let's say Aave, Synthetix, uh, needs the price of gold USD for instance, well basically they'll be contributing in link tokens to have this price feed being sustained, right? And whenever this price feed starts generating a profit, which means this price feed basically has so many users that it's actually turning on a profit, well, the profit it's turning on can be reinvested into even more security, right? So the users who are using this price feed actively and who are paying for it will be able to, let's say, add more node operators, add more data feeds. So they'll be able to govern how the funds, which are allocated and being paid for the specific price feeds, will be allocated. Uh, usually it will be more security. I mean, I hope it will. Um, but yeah, uh, I think that's the way governance is going to work for all these Oracle networks which are currently uh, being um, fed onto the blockchain. I think it will be very important to have Oracle networks which are being leveraged by many different users and these users, the way they'll come to terms on how they leverage it will be some kind of DAO governance process where basically they decide to allocate resources in different manners. Yeah. So Joe, in terms of governance from a protocol level for Oracles, what are your thoughts? How's, how, what, what's the potential impact for say a chain link on Polkadot and how that, that community might engage in Polkadot's governance. Yeah, I mean, just like getting the information from the outside world to make the decision. So like, I think like governance itself doesn't upgrade the chain. Like governance provides, an, it's an interface for people to upgrade the chain in a transparent way where they can participate like in other chains. Um, you know, governance is kind of like, well, we, we have a phone call and talk about it and then uh, we, we decided what to do, but like, how do you get access to that? Or how do you see what happened um, in that discussion? And so like, um, yeah, like our, our main thing with like Polkadot governance is to have, is we have like a few guiding principles there is to have um, like different bo governance bodies um, and then to have it as transparent as possible so that, yeah, there is like the information flow uh, from the outside world and different avenues to pass that in. All right, one more before we take a couple audience questions and then open up the event for networking, as we call it. Uh, so Polkadot is the first uh, network that Chainlink has explored after Ethereum. I'm interested in sort of what uh, went into making that decision and what, what, what you're interested in specifically regarding Polkadot. Yeah, I mean, definitely, I think one of the main reasons was really looking at the ecosystem, what exists out there, and what are the real improvements to what currently exists, right? Like what we have on Ethereum and what people are innovating the most, right? So Polkadot, what I find really fascinating is the way on-chain governance works, for instance. I think, basically, I, I think we need many kind of different implementation and many ways to try out the tech 
to see what works. And I think Polkadot has a really unique way of going about how they're building up their network. Um, I think also something which is quite telling is the interest that it's been getting from, well, I, I've been kind of in this ecosystem of you know looking at node operators, what they operate on. I think node operators are extremely key because these guys are going to basically secure the whole network, right? And seeing right now on Kusama, for instance, 160 operators running, it's pretty impressive, basically. Like going for the thousands. Going for the thousands, going to the, yeah, you know, no limits. So <laughs> I, I, I think it's great, it's really great to see, and it's a really good sign. So uh, on our side, we're blockchain agnostic. An integration takes up some work, you know, still, even though the, the protocol itself is blockchain agnostic, uh, there is no real standard in the industry. Like Polkadot was built in a different way uh, than Ethereum was built, and et cetera, et cetera, right? So it takes some work. It's an investment on our side. And we thought the investment was worth it, and that's why we've been working with the Polkadot team to basically get an integration going, um, I hope, very soon. soon. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, questions for either of them, for both of them? That's good. No questions. Everyone wants to go to eat. That's <laughs> better. Tacos? All right. Thanks for coming, everyone. Thank um, you. Joe and uh, Johan will obviously be around, available to talk more. <laughs>